I'm Petit Unicorn here with uh, the second chapter of The Last Year of Malcolm X, The Evolution of a Revolutionary, written by George Brightman. We are on chapter two, and this is called The Transition Period, so I will be editing the title in order for it to say chapter two, The Transition Period. Now, this is a very short chapter. It's only about 12 pages, so it is likely that this is going to be uh, just under a, a half an hour. So the book reads, the split with the black Muslims took Malcolm by surprise. He was not prepared for it psychologically, ideologically, or organizationally. Psychological readjustment, though painful, came fastest. In the other areas, he needed more time and experience. He had to do more than merely reject attitudes, ideas, and methods long held as a black Muslim. He had to sift them retaining some and revising others, and he had to add new ones. It is one thing to declare independence, another to be able to develop a perspective, philosophy, and movement aiming at the revolutionary changes in society. In a situation where he was surrounded by more pressures and enemies than before, Malcolm now had to do the hardest thing in the world, think for himself. Previously, he had been able to shut his mind to certain difficult questions, the privilege of a lieutenant. As a leader, he had to confront them, ready or not. So I want you to catch the nuance there. I'm deviating from the text here. So um, he didn't have to think for himself anytime because he was being commanded by someone as a lieutenant, right? So a leader and a lieutenant are not the same, right? A lieutenant answers to someone, yields to someone, submits to someone. This is why I pose that submission is actually easier than um, being a dominant party in, in a relationship because really as a leader, you have to confront everything and you everything is on your shoulders. So as a leader, he had to confront uh, these things that he shut his mind out to. Going back to the text, historical precedent for what he wanted to do was, a me was meager or unknown to him. These pages are conjoined. And he did not get much theoretical help from the few black Muslims who joined him at the outset. They were dedicated but less experienced than he was. The brief independent phase of Malcolm X's life, which was only 50 weeks, half of which were spent abroad, really divides into two distinct parts. The first was a transition period, which lasted around two or three months, from the split early in March to his return from Africa at the end of May 1964. A great deal of confusion about what Malcolm stood for and where he was moving can be avoided by clearly distinguishing this transition period from the final period in June 1964 to February 1965. In this transition period, Malcolm inevitably made mistakes. He had made some false starts and he had to retrace his steps. He said and did things which he himself later called errors. In other cases, he did not publicly call them errors, but he changed positions he had taken in the transition period. An example of the first can be found in the Saturday Evening Post version of the autobiography, September 12, 1964. Hoping to avoid conflict with the Black Muslims, Malcolm originally decided not to make his criticisms of Elijah Muhammad public. If he had spoken out, the split would have been sharper but it would have also been bigger. And Elijah Muhammad may, uh, might have had fewer resources with which to attack him. Looking back in the summer of 1964, when he felt no truce between them was possible, Malcolm said, I made an error, I know now, and not speaking out the full truth when I first was suspended. An example of a position changed between the transition and the final periods was in Malcolm's attitude toward white supporters of the freedom struggle. In April, a white pacifist minister was killed by a bulldozer during a Cleveland demonstration against school segregation. At a New York meeting, James Weschler of the New York Post and other liberals demanded that Malcolm pay tribute to the slain minister and he refused. There's a quote here that says, good, what the man did is good, 
but the day is out when you'll find Black people who are going to stand up and applaud the contributions of whites at this late date. Don't you ever think I was, I would, don't you ever think I would use my energies applauding the sacrifice of an individual white man? No, that sacrifice is too late. So I guess this is something, and I'm deviating from the text here, I guess this is something that Malcolm said uh, that he later on uh, regretted on his own, not because somebody told him to, but because, you know, he was checking himself and holding himself accountable. Back to the text, it says, but in December, Malcolm did not need any prodding to praise the two white and one Negro civil rights workers who had been murdered for their voter registration activities in Mississippi during the summer. If the Cleveland death had occurred during the final period, there is no doubt that Malcolm's response would have been different and more effective. The reader who was trying to understand Malcolm's development would therefore do well when he comes across any passage in the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, and Malcolm X speaks or anywhere else to always ask himself, is this from Malcolm's black Muslim period or is this from the transition period or is it from the final period? This will not solve all the problems about contradictory or inconsistent statements, but it will help considerably. It will help among other things to expose the dishonesty or ignorance of commentators and critics who insist on lumping all the periods together. It will surely help to clarify Malcolm's position on such relatively simple questions as interracial marriage. As a black Muslim, he had said that intermarriage was harmful, evil, a device to undermine the freedom struggle. In the transition period, his main emphasis was on the points that intermarriage was difficult and painful for interracial couples. In a world as color hostile as this, and that it did not prove anything positive, his remarks on the subject in the autobiography uh, evidently date from the transition period. Yet before those remarks from the transition period could be published, he said on a Canadian TV program a month before his death that he regarded intermarriage as a personal matter. It's just one human being marrying another human being, another of the strides toward oneness, adding that he did not feel on the defensive about having had different positions in the past since those earlier positions had been reactions by a victim of a discriminatory society. So here you have uh, Malcolm's position on intermarriage, which was neutral, okay? Not pro or against, but rather indifferent. Got it? Neutral. Proceeding back to the text, it reads, there were other questions more complex than intermarriage where Malcolm did not get the time to follow his thinking to its probable conclusions. But even with these, it is helpful to bear in mind the transition period and to avoid mixing it up with a period that followed where Malcolm's thought reached its most militant and most mature level. Two other precautions can be recommended in approaching Malcolm's statements during both the transition and final periods. One concerns the relations between Malcolm and the people who interviewed him. Most of them were hostile. He sensed this immediately and it affected the way he responded. See Appendix D for Jack Barnes article, Two Interviews, which contrasts Malcolm's answers to friendly representatives of the young socialist with those he gave to the antagonistic liberal Robert Penn Warren. In addition, as Malcolm confessed, he had become guilty at times of giving sensationalist answers to reporters. He himself was partly responsible for his distorted image in the press. He told Marlene Nadel, the reporters came with preconceived answers to their questions. They were looking for sensationalism for something that would sell papers and I gave it to them. If they had asked probing intelligent questions, they would have gotten different answers. I don't know how many times I've been through something similar where people come to me looking for a fight and I give it. Anyhow, Malcolm was learning to control this tendency after the split, but had not fully mastered it at his death. The reader must also make allowances for the, for the conditions under which many of Malcolm's statements were made and the effects these conditions had on how they were formulated. Frank Kofsky, reviewing Malcolm X Speaks, correctly notes that and this is a quote, not from Malcolm, but from Frank, and it reads, not every detail of Malcolm's political philosophy has been elaborated with absolute clarity in his speeches. 
Given the workhorse schedule of Malcolm's final months and the absence of any opportunity for sustained reflection, one must expect that here and there, an occasional solecism, murky generalization, or even self-contradiction will crop up. But these minor lapses are to be found in the rhetoric of anyone who speaks extemporaneously. With the frequency that Malcolm did during those hectic days, they are entirely inconsequential in comparison with the overall tendency of Malcolm's thinking, which must impinge upon even the most casual reader of these addresses with unmistakable force. My phone is uh, falling off crazy. So I would like to commit myself to reading one chapter a day. And it just so happens that that is the full extent of chapter two. So I guess with the time that I have left, I want to make a few comments about uh, Meghan Markle and uh, Prince Harry. It is my opinion that African-Americans should support Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. It is also my opinion that uh, the two of them should run for the White House. I don't mean as, you know, president and vice president, but I do mean I would love to see Harry as a naturalized American and then become the president of the United States. Um, although he is white, I think that is uh, it is relatable for him to become a naturalized citizen, um, having been an immigrant or a refugee. And in his case, I would posit that he is both an immigrant and a refugee. Now, sometimes refugees flee wars, but he's literally fleeing the firm and the institution of a country. Uh, Meghan Markle was very clear about the fact that she did not identify as a black woman. And for me, that's okay. For me, that's okay because I'm from the West Coast and I understand what it is to be a white passing uh, biracial woman. She was not treated as a black woman. And so many times you have a situation where people don't treat you by what you identify as, but oftentimes as what you look like. So let's say Rosario Dawson is actually mostly Irish, but we all treat her as an Afro-Latina because that's what she looks like. So she gets casted in roles, not for Irish women, but for women of color. Um, so I understand how this could color Megan's experience when it comes to identifying as a person of color, but not as a black woman. Her, her mother's life and struggle was not hers. And even her mother herself is, according to myself, you know, uh, a fair skinned woman, uh, not like pale or quote unquote high yellow, but definitely lighter than a brown paper bag. If you want to talk these uh, archaic skin color and hair texture feature tests that, you know, abounded uh, during a, segregation among black people in the early 1900s. So I'm very moved by Tyler Perry offering Prince Harry and Meghan Markle um, basically Medea's house to stay in. I mean, literally, I remember looking at that mansion and I was just like, oh, what a great set. And my mom was like, babe, that's not his set, that's his house right? In that diary of a mad black woman. So I don't know if that's still the house or not, but if there's anybody to give you asylum, I mean, Tyler Perry has got land, hand over fist, hand over fist. I also believe that um, whatever was personally exchanged between Jay-Z, Beyonce, Meghan Markle, and Harry was something very quick and um, very firm. And I think this is also why Beyonce cannot allow herself to befriend uh, Kim Kardashian, despite the efforts, the efforts that Kim Kardashian made to befriend her, because Beyonce's decisions do uh, affect African American women on a cultural level. Uh, so she cannot give herself permission to befriend a culture vulture because of the cultural implications as the first lady of music in our country, as we know it at this present time in history. That being said, um, I do not know how things are going to develop. I do see the very stereotypical treatment of Megan as, you know, the angry black woman, the bullying, this and that. 
and you have people in the royal family who have allegedly done things on Epstein Island, and I don't want to go there. Um, I quite like that my channel isn't in any danger, and I don't want to put it in any danger, but uh, the reason Black women are agreeing with her without knowing firsthand what's going on with her is because the way that she is describing these experiences, this passive aggression, these microaggressions, this this uh, codified racism, we've all experienced, especially if you come from a place like the Pacific Northwest, like I do. So they say American racism is more blatant, but in reality, that's racism below the Mason-Dixon line. Southern racism is very blatant, but oftentimes in the Pacific Northwest and the northern parts of America, it's it's very subtle. And it is insidious because it is so subtle, it's hard to call out. And it's and it's a strange thing because a person can call out homophobia all they want to, and all they need to be is gay to do it. But if you call out racism, it's not the same way where all you need to be is black to do it. You have to convince white people, convince them the way Sharon Osbourne was talking to uh, Cheryl Underwood. You have to convince them that you've gone through something. This is why uh, there is a police officer uh, who had gone viral telling people when you get pulled over, claim that you are gay because you likely cannot prove a hate crime against a black person, no matter how apparent it is to everyone. But most people have a member of the LGBTQ community in their family, whereas most people in America do not have a black family member uh, as a relative. So it's more relatable. And also it's a community that um, has a very uh, interesting position right now in that they are truly di discriminated against, but truly powerful. I'm mean, truly a force to work with. I was joking with someone the other day saying that Starbucks is an LGBTQ mafia because for some reason, everybody in power and in control that I ever ran into in a Seattle, Bellevue, Wizzaquah, whatever it is, Starbucks, I mean, that that's what I ran into. And um, my little heterosexual, Muslim, whatever it is. I mean, I, I didn't fare well, fare well, no matter how loving and accepting uh, and tolerant, I know that I am. And I know that I have been and always will be. Um, so black women are able to identify with what Meghan Markle is saying because it's a story that we all have. And even more so that part of the reason we know that she's telling the truth is because she didn't go through these things in California as a white passing woman. She can pass with her hair straight. Now, when she was a child, no, she can pass. She couldn't uh, just with a regular flat iron over that. But, but the chemical process of her hair, it's very soft and straight. She can pass. Uh, and I do believe in California, she had a much, a much less racialized experience in California here in America than she has had in, um, I don't know, this royal palace with a firm, the institution. So yes, I believe she should be protected and supported by us. Um, not just from compassion for her, because of course, especially as women, as intuitives, as empaths, we feel her pain, but also on a political level, we know not what kind of implications, like this may be the beginning of the end of the firm. It could be very well be, you have, a, I, I believe it was Barbados who has decided, you know, we're, we're, we're no more queen for us. There are a number of uh, British islands that are in discussion now about, you know, uh, no more queen, no thank you. Uh, I find Megan to be a unifying figure because what she is going through is what a lot of Indian women that I've met have gone through and their families where, uh, you know, how dark is the baby going to be exactly is a question she was, uh, Harry was asked by a blood relative. And um, that's incredibly painful and incredibly insulting. And here's the deal, that baby looks uh, as adult as Harry's doppelganger and fairly pale. 
And however that little girl comes out, I understand that genetics are genetics and black people, it's like you roll a dice, but but listen here, she's, she's only half black. And I would posit that her mother is not even 100% African-American. Her mother looks like she's some kind of a Southern blend of uh, Mama Beyonce, Mama Tina Knowles, uh, Creole, black, French, Native American something, because she's not at all, you know, um, the color of a, let's say, a Cheryl Underwood, right? She's not Bernie Mac. Um, so this child will also come out pale and, I mean, majority white. So um, I personally do not consider a person who is mostly white black because I do not subscribe to the one drop rule. However, I do not promote people denying who they are or their heritage. Um, I have such a small portion of Thai in me. I have such a small portion of Indonesian in my blood. I have such a small portion of Sri Lankan, uh, Chinese, um, Myanmar Burmese in my blood, but I feel that I can see it in my face, even though it is tiny. And I'm clearly, uh, I took an ancestrydna.com test and I'm clearly a black woman. But even if you look at this photo, the shape of my eyes, the eyelids, uh, there, there's clearly an Asian there, just like there's clearly an African there. And I actually have, uh, I, I think it's about 20 something percent uh, white, um, British, French, uh, I don't quite remember um, the results um, are up on my Instagram if you're interested, but um, I don't deny any part of it. I remember growing up before I knew that I had uh, any Asian ancestry and it's arguably Native American ancestry. I, I don't know and I don't want to push that because it's a controversial topic, but um, I remember growing up and I was just like, I'm such a fake Asian, I'm such a fake Asian. And all of my close friends were Asian and all of the food that I liked and never got tired of was just straight up Asian. I could, you know, fire up my rice cooker every day, multiple times a day. It's rice and eggs for, you know, breakfast, you know, maybe rice and some chopped up hot dogs with soy sauce and, you know, sesame seed oil for lunch. And maybe, you know, I mean, just all over the place, really, you know, maybe some uh, yakimandu or chache for, you know, dinner, kimchi, something, I don't know. And then to find out later that that Asian actually exists, is, uh, it, it was amusing for me. So this is why I say, although I'm not sitting here looking at Harry and Meghan's son as a black child, that black is there and that black is beautiful. And I do not think that it is something that I would, I don't recommend that people take that away from the child. But I mean, categorically, if you had to put the child in a category, the child would technically be white. Uh, Meghan is a biracial you know, to some degree, um, because I would argue that her mother, her mother appears that she's not, look, I'm catching myself, getting myself into a conversation that I really, um, I really don't want to become a gamete table up here. What I want to say is that I believe Meghan Markle should be supported by the collective of African-American people and uh, also by America because she is our own. She is ours. She is from us. Uh, yes, we live in a racist country. Uh, I mean, we, we have all these different kinds of things to discuss, sure, but I'm all for uh, baby steps, baby steps. So please support Megan, support Harry, and yes, I would love to see them both in the White House. I really and truly would. Um, fun fact, white gingers and blacks have always had some kind of a weird connection. I mean, we've had an odd relationship where we just, we combine some way, somehow. And um, it could be because of the way that gingers are ostracized by whites. But um, <sighs> there's always been that connection and there are several examples of that. Uh, even recently when uh, there was an African-American woman who was uh, trying to walk home in California through a Trump rally and they tried to beat her to death and it was a white ginger, proud boy who, who saved her life. Anyhow, uh, there are many cases like this. 
of the Blacks and Gingers. And I think that is something um, that is represented in Megan and, and Harry and their relationship. Uh, I find it odd that people were calling her a social climber and a gold digger when in reality, um, you've seen Harry whispering to people's ears like, hey, you know, she's a voice actress. She does this. She does, you know, trying to get her a job. He left on, you know, Diana's money and um, right now they're between her money and Diana's. So um, I hope that puts everything to rest. Uh, as far as her being a gold digger, a social climber. Um, no matter what titles that they strip from her, she is, um, she's our princess. She married a prince. So, um, I would hope that uh, because we have so many conversations uh, in this YouTube and this sector where we're like, oh, mixed women are not black women. And I would say, sure, in, in 2021, no, because here's the deal. Even Irish people were not white people. Even Italian people were not white people. They had to earn their whiteness as the years went by, as the things changed, yada, yada, yada. They became a different class. And sure, you have the blacks in Louisiana who went from being black to being Creole, X, Y, Z. Like, like, yeah, they're their own group. However, we're still a part of one another because my uncle is your dad so you're still family with you're still kin to me even if we do not represent the same group or part like you're still kin to me you're kinfolk quite literally so even if biracial people are a different group in 2021 and I think that's beautiful that they don't have to just claim one side and they can claim hey I am who I am you know uh but, but they're still ours and we are still theirs. So I hope that there is some level of unity that we can uh, form and support her and protect her because uh, her life is very much mirroring the life of Princess Diana. And um, one of my very first role models with, was Mother Teresa, right? I just knew I wanted to grow up and be a nun and work in an orphanage. And uh, shortly after her, uh, Princess Diana, uh, Princess Diana won everything to me. I remember that car accident. I remember the motorcycle. I remember the tunnel. I remember everything uh, all over the news. Um, and I believe uh, very much that uh, they say uh, the baby Archie, his new favorite word is hydrate. And he tells everyone to hydrate. And whenever they leave the house, he says, drive safe. I think that's very eerie, considering Princess Diana's car accident, that this tiny, tiny child who should just be saying bye-bye, bye-bye, see you later, is like, drive safe. I do believe there is some ancestral influence there, but uh, since this is not the channel for that, you can subscribe to Chocolate Angel, which is my other channel. And that is where I will talk about all the dark things that um, qualify me as a, a little bitty, a little bit of Badu in there. Um, thank you for being here and commenting, Darren and Jams, uh, Terry and Dorian. I am getting out of here. It's been half an hour. I want to thank you for uh, being in that reading with me. And I look forward to coming back to you tomorrow with chapter three. All right, y'all. I'm not going to eat a corner and I'm out.